to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario. Really great show for you today as we are back from our little hiatus again that we took after our, our most recent episode. But we are back now on a weekly schedule. I, I promise you that, that uh, now that we're into it, we're going to go through the summer into the fall with the weekly schedule again. A lot of fun stuff lined up over the course of the next few months that uh, I, I had to take a couple weeks to plan it all out, but we were able to do it. And I'm very excited for what we have coming up, including today's episode about a wonderful new book from Marion McKinnon Crook entitled Always Pack a Candle, A Nurse in the Caribou Chilcotin. This is a first person account of Marion's experience as a nurse in the Caribou Chilcotin region. She was responsible for about 9,300 square kilometers in this area of northern British Columbia and she had to drive around and and do public health services for various communities she wouldn't see people for you know a month or two at a time a lot of challenges particularly just in navigating this region and and this was her first job out of university so she goes as a young 22 year old fresh out of school and quickly learns that doesn't really know everything and there are things that were taught at school that maybe don't apply here or things that weren't taught at school and it, it really shows her experience in this region touches on the personal experience and also the systemic injustice that she found up in the caribou chilcotin region just a wonderful book as i mentioned it's a first person account as we'll talk about on the show with marion she's a writer independent of this book uh, she, she's written mystery books and it really comes through that literary experience when you read this book it, it very much comes across as a story and you can see the character development that comes through it uh, she does take some liberties she says in, in the start with some of the characters and she's changed names but it's all based in reality in her experience in the 1960s in this region doing public health work so just an absolutely wonderful book certainly we will encourage everybody to check it out and i know you're going to want to after you listen to this discussion with marion mckinnon crook okay and marion mckinnon crook joins us this morning marion how are you i'm great thank you i really appreciate you joining me from all the way across the country this is uh, always fun when we get to do this long distance and I'm curious to, uh, to start, as we're going to get to the book, of course, I want to know why you wanted to tell your story and why you wanted to tell the story now. Well, I had, I, I'm a writer. Uh, I'm, I've retired from teaching nursing, but I've always been a writer periodically through my life. But when I retired, um, about 2012, I decided to write full time again. And I started writing mysteries and I had a hiatus between the publication of, I think my first mystery with Coffee Town Press and my second one. And I thought I've got about four months here to do something different. And I had all these stories of my first years of nursing in the caribou and what an adventure it was. And I had these pictures in my mind, these little vignettes of incidences that happened during my my time there and i thought if i don't put these down i might forget them or i'll get hit by a bus <laughs> or something <laughs> and and so i started writing and i had so much fun revisiting all those all that wonderful time in my life <laughs> so i and and it wasn't all wonderful i have to tell you but right. it was all exciting <laughs> yes and that certainly comes across in the book. So so let's get to the start of this story. And as I mentioned in the intro, this really does profile your career. But I'm curious, can we go back before your career? What was your upbringing like? And what prompted you to want to get into nursing, particularly this type of nursing in the field? Well, I grew up as a middle child, well, the oldest of the middle of six. So um, 
there were always uh, lots of um, uh, um, my parents were always occupied with children. So being the middle child, you get a chance to be yourself, really, because nobody pays a whole lot of attention to you unless it's to correct you. Right. <laughs> and so, but, but my dad did um, do a lot of teaching to all the kids. But I grew up uh, wanting to be in the sciences. And um, I, I was really intrigued by math and science. And I went to a girls' high school where nobody thought that was unusual. Uh, in a, in a co-ed school, girls were discouraged. But in my school, they were not discouraged from math and science. So I really enjoyed them. And there were not many career opportunities for girls in my day. So I, I got myself into university. My parents were quite happy to send all their children to university. <clears throat> so I got into university. And I took the academics, of course, and and I really liked it. I liked it even better at, at university. But there weren't many things I could do with it. And there were quite a few of us. So I really didn't want to be a burden on my parents uh, for forever. Although my dad was willing to pay for me to go to university as long as I wanted. But I needed to get out and get move, working. <clears throat> so I did apply to veterinary school. Um, and they turned me down because I was a woman. They didn't take women. And so I uh, had either choice, really, in those days, of a teacher or a nurse. And I thought I can be a nurse and not be in the hospital because <laughs> I, I didn't want to be surrounded by walls. And so um, I, I picked public health. I loved it, too. Yeah, it was great. So how did you end up in the caribou Chilcotin area? How, how did that position take form and and you know in the book you talk about how your mom was a little skeptical early on about your ability to survive and, and thrive yeah. in that environment so so how did you come about getting into that region had you been into that region before you took that job well that's an interesting question because yeah i did my sister and i who she, my sister was two years younger so when i uh, right after grade 12 Oh, I asked my dad if we could borrow his car, and he had a couple of cars, and um, he said yes. So we took his car, my sister and I, and we drove up through the Caribou, up and all over to Banff and in that area. And we had a had a road trip, the two of us. We had a ball, but we stopped in Williams Lake. I said, you know, I might I might want to work here. Let's just. Well, that was maybe it was after I'd been in university a couple of years. I guess it wasn't after grade twelve. It seems to me I was pretty young, maybe eighteen. Anyway, we um, I thought I might want to work there one day, so we stopped in the health unit, and uh, I talked to the supervisor, and she encouraged me. So when I graduated from university, I um, I applied there because I stopped there. So that was how I, I just really picked it out of the air, really. <laughs> so it's a pretty organic decision on your part. You just were yeah, there, it was, liked it. well yeah. said, yeah. <laughs> so when you get this job, the book starts of you getting there and, and meeting the supervisor, going to where you're going to live. And it, it really is striking this, this sense to me as the reader I got the sense of great uncertainty that you were feeling. You mentioned even. The, the, the trip up, it was somewhat hot and uncomfortable and the roads were making you nauseous uh, because they're so twisty and turny. Yeah. How did you feel when you initially got there? Your expectation of when you first were there, you said you were liked it. Uh, when you were there with your sister, you thought this would be a nice place. Compared to when you were actually there to live and to work in this region, what, what was that like? Because it comes across in the book kind of like a culture shock. Well, it was in a way, um, because it was kind of, it was very young. Everybody was very young. There were a great population of people from the prairies and moving there for the jobs in the, in the lumber industry mostly and, and the service industry. But how I felt was a bit overwhelmed because I was a new graduate and they drummed into your head that you had a degree, but no, ex very little experience. So you have, you're only a beginning nurse. Well, a beginning nurse had a 3,600 square mile territory, <laughs> which was, you know, just, oh my God. And there's no, like we had no 
communications, really. So um, I was on my own making decisions. And I really had to, I mean, I packed books with me um, to look things up. And uh, I, you know, I, that's how you managed. I could phone occasionally on the, at the settlements. I could phone, but I don't think I ever did. <laughs> I had to make up my mind. Yeah. So how would you say that that transition worked as, as for you personally, as someone who you have this degree, you, you have the knowledge from school, and yet now you're in the field and you have to apply that knowledge. And oftentimes in, in cases of, of things where you haven't seen before, you don't necessarily know what to do. What was that process like that here you have a patient, you have somebody sitting in front of you and you might not know necessarily what to do, yet you're the expert. You can't call out, as you mentioned in some locations. What what was that feeling like? And did you ever fully get comfortable in knowing that you don't necessarily know everything? Because I know a lot of students come out of university with this feeling of, I know everything now. So so just, you know, can you talk us through that process a little bit? Well, I think you'd be cured of that pretty quickly in the caribou. Um, <laughs> you really didn't know everything. I, I think I I admitted when I didn't know, and and people were fine with that. You know, they they hoped I'd know, but if I didn't know, I said so, and um, or or I said I'd get back to them. You know, um, but I or I'd send them a letter or something. But I I I didn't. Where it came to medicine, I didn't pretend to know what I didn't know. That's very dangerous, and I. I, but what the experience did for me was it gave me amazing confidence very quickly because I was very often right, you see. <laughs> so, so after a while, you you know, you kept a certain humble attitude because you're going to meet things you don't know. But the patients were like worked with me. The thing about public health is you don't come in and tell people what to do because you are in their house. And they can just tell you to leave. So you're not like a hostage in the hospital where you're the authority. You're in the, you are the authority in public health in, in some areas, but not in all. And they're, they, you're always aware that you're in their house at their, with their permission. So, so you, you, so you mentioned the region and how big the region was. And that sort of reminds me, as you were talking about being in people's houses, you have to have their confidence. They can throw you out if you want. So how would you describe the job of being a public health nurse going around in such a large area, being a, a community health individual, someone in that field? How would you describe that job? Because I'm sure you would describe it very differently from what the job posting might have looked like when you first got the job. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, it's a teaching job in a lots of ways in that what you try to do is teach people um, the more healthy way of living or a healthy way of dealing with the problems they have and putting them in touch with resources so that they can actually manage their own life. So you're not, you're, the um, the essence of the job is to do as little as possible to make it po oh, not as little as possible, but to do what you need to do to get people to look after themselves and to see the need to look after themselves. And so you you don't you aren't in there usually for a long time, just enough to stimulate people to look after themselves. And I I love that aspect of it. Sometimes you did repetitive things like give him immunizations every Friday afternoon at the clinic in town. And, you know, I mean, you just did them over and over because different people and different babies, but it was a job that had to be done to prevent um, diseases. So you did those things and you constantly looking for sexual transmitted disease and stuff like that. Every Friday afternoon, hit the pubs to try and find people. Um, so you did things regularly that didn't make didn't make a difference in terms of teaching, but I really liked the process of um, prenatal classes, which were new at the time, and um, of and 
and teaching people how to find the resources they need. And, and I, I like that part of it, which is why I probably ended up teaching nursing in university. But yeah, I like, I like that part of it a lot. And I'm not, I don't, as, as your question asks, with, well, how is it different from the job description? They didn't, they didn't emphasize that part of it, the teaching part of it. And that's a part I really liked. And, and how much does the specifics of the region that you're in influence what you're doing in the field? So in the, the Caribou Chilcotin region, for instance, like how would you describe it? What is the demographics of that area and how much is the specifics of the, whether it's the economics of the community, the demographics of the community, even linguistically within the community, how much does that shape what you were doing on the ground as you were working with these communities? Well, it shaped it completely because you might have a director from Victoria to teach um, dental health, for instance, in horsefly. And they send you these posters of, you know, good dental health. Well, one of the posters they sent me was of a beaver. And the, you, you can't take that to horsefly because the kids will say beavers don't have white teeth. They have orange teeth. Mm. Like, you know, there, it was the, the people in the area all you had to adjust everything to fit the people and to make sense in the, in the community you were in. And I, I know I would, <clears throat> I think I said in the book that, that when I went into any um, Indo-Canadian home, um, they always offered me tea and it was always had four teaspoons of sugar in it, which I took my tea black, but I drank it with four teaspoons of sugar in it because that, that was the culture, you know, of the time of, the, of that household. So, you just always had to adapt, and um, I found I found that fun actually. <laughs> I found adapting like that a lot of fun and uh, and very instructive. And right. you know, giving oral polio out of the back of of somebody's truck, and you know, stuff like that. It's really interesting. Yeah. And and in terms of the region and the the people, what, what how diverse is that region that you're working? Because it's such a huge area. You know, how many various communities of people would you have to work with in a given month? Well, um, quite a few, although I like, there was a, a very big um, Indigenous community. They had their own federal nurses, but lots of, of Indigenous people were not status, what they call status Indian. And, um, and so they came under my purview. So... So the provincial was their was their um, go to place, provincial health. Um, there were the Indo Canadian people who settled around the mill white outside of of um, of Williams Lake proper, but they they mingled. They they inter. I didn't see too much prejudice or anything like that. The kids played hockey and everybody mingled. Um, there were there were small communities around a one room school in different places where they didn't get out much. And um, um, they were had kind of distinctive flavors to them. And uh, what else would we have? There were a lot of um, um, immigrant people, a lot of people from Holland were there. And it was a, it was lively community. Well, most areas were pretty lively. I liked it, yeah. <laughs> And one of the lines that stuck out to me in, in the early part of the book, and this is actually in your author's note at the start of the book, it said, you wrote, in the age of rock and roll, Woodstock, free love and civil rights, I nursed in the wild regions of the caribou where we were less interested in social movement, social movements and more interested in staying alive and surviving the rough roads, oncoming logging trucks and the challenges of country nursing. So... What I take from that is that sort of what we talked about a little earlier is that this region and, and the specifics of the area are really what is governing your work. So it also comes across as that this area was somewhat isolated. So how much did the the movements of the time, not necessarily social movements, but say within the, the health field and the developments that were going on within health? You talked about prenatal care earlier as being a, a new thing, certainly the awareness surrounding STDs would be another 
issue that, that you, you talked about. So how much uh, does the, the mentality of the 60s, that era, influence things on the ground, if at all? Well, um, the, the, you're talking about the, um, the, the medical knowledge. Uh, there was a lot of prenatal care. There just wasn't, weren't prenatal classes given by the public health nurse. That was the new thing. There was lots of prenatal care by the doctors. Um, but the, the, um, uh, the health information came from Victoria every day um, in the mail. And every morning I read all the updates on that we all did um, on the um, new things out for medical care. So in terms of uh, medical science, we were always getting the latest thing. And so we were bringing that to the community and they expected us to do that. So there wasn't any, um, there weren't any anti-vaxxers. There were a few conscientious objectors, but very few to, to vaccines. People embraced the new um, medical knowledge that we could bring to them. And for the most part, they trusted it. Not always, but for the most part, they trusted it. But it was our job to stay up to date. The, I like that part of it as well. Uh, so while the areas were isolated, <clears throat> lots of people went out to Vancouver for a, you know, a, a week's holiday or, um, you know, dro they drove miles and miles to socialize, miles. Um, well, once later on was part of a band and we would go 60 miles to play a game. <laughs> you know, it was, um, uh, people would, would wanted to communicate with each other. They were isolated. And we did not pay much attention to the social movements, as I said, because they didn't really affect us. Um, we were just trying to deal with the practicalities of minus 40, you know, and right. uh, um, we didn't have time to worry about, or we didn't seem to feel involved. At least I didn't, and I don't think my friends did either. Mm -hmm. But but as far as medical knowledge, no, we weren't that isolated. And I think the legal knowledge was up to date as well. And, um, I think people should stay up to date that, that way. Right. We had I've, phones after all. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, that's interesting too, you say driving 60 miles to socialize. In, in this era that we live right now, uh, you know, that's unheard of, right? Uh, um, oh, yeah. you know, and, uh, and certainly yeah. the the idea of new medical knowledge. I, I, I'm intrigued by that because that certainly has a lot of relevance to today as well as, as new information, new medical knowledge comes out every day as we live through the the COVID experience, if you will, there is reluctance. You see it all the time in the press right now. So for you in your career at that time, did you get any pushback, any hesitancy of people who were skeptical of new medical advances, new techniques, new drugs, whatever it was? Did you see that? In, a, in, in ways that mirror some of what we are seeing today in some parts of the country? Very rarely, very rarely. Because if they only saw me once a month and I came with information, they were ready to hear it hmm. because they didn't have alternate sources of information. Um, they had their own doctor, but it depended on how well the doctor communicated, whether they got information and whether they asked him the right or her the right questions. But... I was there captive in their house and they asked me whatever they weren't intimidated by me and they asked me whatever they wanted and they trusted for the most part they trusted that I knew what I was doing I knew what I was that I had the right information and if I didn't I'd try and find out and get back to them but they only would see me a lot of these places only once a month right so they were they weren't most it was rare that they didn't believe me although i did report in the book one woman who did not believe me even though i was right <laughs> <laughs> now the, the book also makes reference to as you say the, there's a certain humility in doing this type of work and there's there are cases where mistakes are made as you, or you're learning as you go and and reflect back and oh maybe i would have done this differently yeah. How how much of you being honest with people about that and, and working with them, that, that being humble, as you mentioned earlier, that humility, how important is that or was that to your career in building connections with these communities who, as you mentioned, you might only be seeing once a month? 
I think it was really important. Um, it was important for me because, you know, you can't be in this field without making mistakes. And the only way not to make a mistake is to do nothing. And that's a mistake in itself. So, I mean, hospital nurses face this every day about a medication theirs. And you have to be honest, and they are honest about them so that you can prevent it from happening again or take the con or deal with the consequences. Um, most of the time they're very small errors, but sometimes they aren't. And so it's it, the confederacy of medical people is that yes, you do make mistakes and you just have to admit to them and go on. Um, and my dad insisted on malpractice insurance. I'm sure I was the only nurse in the province that had malpractice insurance. <laughs> Anyway, in those days, everybody has it now. But um, in those days, no, uh, it was a bit of a comfort, actually. <laughs> now, the book also talks about, in a similar vein, your relationship with doctors, which occasionally weren't the greatest. So how did you navigate situations where you have a doctor in an area who is, is either talking down to you, being condescending, presenting different information. How did you manage those relationships with your patients, the people who you're working with, who might be getting conflicting information from a doctor, or at the very least, working with a doctor who might not be fully respectful of you and your credentials? Well, the, the, the word I would use is carefully. I, I work carefully. <laughs> but uh, I have to say that um, most, almost every one of the doctors was great, but there was occasional one. And um, um, I never did, actually, I don't think my license allowed me to directly contradict a doctor. So there were lots of ways to get around it. And without, sometimes, you know, the patient still had faith in that doctor, even though the information was wrong. But I, I did not want to um, disrupt that. So I usually managed to, uh, get the information and I mean I didn't always know I didn't have medical degree I am doctor's degree but sometimes I was pretty firm on on my knowledge like for tuberculosis for instance I had quite a extensive education in that and I, I and I had people on the end of the phone that I could call so in in the Vancouver the TB center so I pretty much knew what I was talking about there so I just tried to carefully work around it and just occasionally have a confrontation, but not very often. <laughs> um, I mentioned earlier that going into this, you, you talked that your mom was a little nervous about the experience, your, what you would experience going into this region. And it's, it, as we said, it's a vast area of, of what, 9,300 square kilometers, it, it says uh, early in the book. And in, you it's cold, it, you know, it gets cold here. That's the winter time. You talk about going out with uh, antifreeze and chains and chocolate bars. And, and of course the, the title of the book, always pack a candle. What was, what were those experiences like driving around in this remote area? You're on logging roads occasionally, just as a, as a human being going out as a, someone in their early twenties, what was that like for you? And, how would you describe some of the some of those situations that reading them back, I would describe as heroin, and I was nervous for you, even though this has happened fifty years ago. You know, how do you reflect on that part of the job? Well, to describe it, sometimes it was terrifying, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the the balance to that is I was young, and you know how when you're young, you think you can do anything, and <laughs> nurses had done it before me. So why couldn't, I mean, I couldn't say I couldn't do it. I could drive, so I could therefore go. But uh, there's one hill on the way to Likely in the wintertime. It is so narrow and you can't see around the corner. And I know that the logging truck could be coming down the hill toward me, wouldn't be able to stop. There's a cliff on one side. And I used to sound my horn knowing he wouldn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> but I would go as soon as I got around that corner. I just breathe. <laughs> that corner was just 
Oh, a difficult one. Yeah. And was there a, a real difference when it came to winter versus summer? Was there almost like you could exhale in the summer that you felt better about traveling exactly, around? Exactly, Sean. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> how I felt in the summer. Oh, you. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, well, one of the things the book also talks about is the revelation of sorts that you have towards systemic injustice, the, the problems with public health and, and how it's administered. For you, what was the first moment or, or was there an incident that really clued you into some of the systemic injustice that exists within the health field? Um, I can't remember. I should read my own book, but I, <laughs> I can't remember the first time that I realized. I think it was when I realized there was a Catholic church at one end of Williams Lake for Native people and a Catholic church at the other end for white people. And I thought, what is this all about? I mean, I was so naive about that. And then there was a, a federal Indian health um, service and a provincial health service. Now we had everybody in the provincial health service, but I, there are so many things that really bothered me. I sometimes get a, um, a form to fill out for people's medications and it would say status Indian or not. And I wouldn't answer it because I thought, no, I, I'm not doing anything by race. I just not. And, um, and that would cause a lot of trouble, but so the clerks would fill it in, right? Cause I wouldn't do it. <laughs> And um, I started getting really aware, and then I started meeting people who were, who were Aboriginal or Indigenous, and I, and um, you know they're, they're friends, and I just started thinking this is a crazy world we have. It was very, it would, it took it some time for me to see it um, because I'd never experienced it, and um, I took, I couldn't believe people to act that way or set things up this way, so I. I did manage a few things. Um, we used to have, um, in fact, it was reverse uh, prejudice, but we used to have um, measles, mumps, and rubella uh, immunizations separately. And you got rubella free, but the other two you had to pay for if you were not part of the Federal Indian Health Act. And so if you were, you got it all in one shot, which was a better vaccine. So I decided that I was not going to give immunization according to race. So everybody who came to me got the one shot without paying, right? And that really disrupted things. And so I talked to my staff, my, my fellow nurses, and said, do you ask people their race before you give them a shot? And they looked at me and said, that's not ethical. I said, no, that's not ethical. So we wrote the... Uh, our licensing body, which was the RNEBC, and said we refuse to ask a person the race before we get the shot. And our medical health officer supported us. And then they changed it all over the province of BC to everybody got MMR. Everybody got in one shot. And I don't know if we had much to do with it, but we weren't doing it in the caribou. Mm. <laughs> so it was, you know, you do your little bit of subversion where you can, you know. Right. Well, well, you see it frequently, right? That these little things or seemingly little things can lead to large scale changes. And the people who are e either refusing to participate in a system that they, they recognize injustice in or inequality in, that that can feed up a lot of the times. And in a case where you have a lot of agency because of the geographic realities of where you are, I think that's a very empowering thing for someone in your position, when you're on the ground, you can see the reality of what's going on and you don't have that immediate response of somebody literally looking over your shoulder. There's people who are obviously there who are your supervisors and people you answer to, but it's not necessarily in the moment, or at least that's the way I read it. And did you feel as though you had that level of autonomy or agency within the process? Yeah, you're right. I, I did feel that way. I felt good actually to do something. Mm -hmm. And, um, and and it's true, if everybody took a stand, you wouldn't have so much, but um, boy, that was a very well-established um, prejudicial system. Um, not in that instance, it was reversed, but in most instances, it was uh, uh, indigenous people who suffered. And um, 
uh, it was it was oh it was hard to combat really hard but lots of people did and uh, the indigenous people themselves got organized and did so it changed but it took a long time to change yeah there was more agency because you didn't really have a supervisor and if you knew the supervisor was coming you could just book out. the one from the consultant from victoria was coming you could just book out into your you know, the hinterland every year right <laughs> and and the other part of of the story of of injustice systemic injustice that i i wanted to ask about you mentioned early on in the book your son and and raising a, a son who has experienced racism uh, a member of the Gitsan Nation. I hope I said that right. Gitsan. A Gitsan. A member of the Gitsan Nation. So, how yeah. much does does that personal experience shape the way you think about this time in your life and seeing the systemic racism uh, or the systemic injustice that you notice through your career? Like, how much does that personal and professional crossover just influence well, the way you think? Well, um, I'm not. I'm not sure because. Because um, there's quite a difference in years between when I dealt with the racism he felt he sure. faced and when I dealt with the racism when I was a naive 22 year old. Um, so by the time I he was in my life, I was much more educated and aware, um, and and knew more about how to combat it and what opportunities to give him and all that sort of thing. Um, I, his daughter lives with me now and she's 15 and um, goes to school here. And there's a, it's a huge difference now, huge difference now than it was when he, even he was younger. So things have improved greatly. Right. But there, there would be some legacy of the things that you saw and, and experienced in your time that would still be present, right? The, the need to fix systemic issues certainly would still be present, uh, I would assume, in the in the region and uh, the connections that you have there. I, I would imagine that any sort of idea that, well, everything's okay now would be somewhat misplaced. I would, that would be oh, my yeah. assumption, right? I, yeah. I think, I think the thing that's changed a great deal is the uh, notion of the value of the Indigenous cultures, mm. all the different cultures that are around, that instead of being well, it's okay. They're part. They're part of the regular um, uh, society. It's wait a minute. Not they have their own society. They have things to offer us. And I mean, even in terms of environmental care, you know, where everybody's looking to the indigenous ways to find out how to deal with the environment and climate change. So it's really changed to um, one of tolerance, acceptance, and now it's it's valuing what we have here. I think that's the big change. So, of course, you, you mentioned that you would go on after your time in the field to teach at the university level. What made you make that decision to come back uh, out of the field to, to work in the university setting? Obviously, the way this job is described in the book doesn't seem like anybody really could physically do it for their whole career it just seems so challenging but what was the motivation for you to make that shift come in off of the the field nursing um i i did come off the when they, my children were young because i had my hands full of them but i did do some um casual hospital nursing for a while and then i went back to public health again when they were in school and so i did it for quite a few years but then I I moved from the Caribou down to the coast and um, got a master's degree and in liberal studies. <laughs> so the nature of reason and the nature of passion and the nature of nationalism and all sorts of things I wanted to know about. And then I got a PhD in education and um, I took all that to the university. And, uh, and and it's teaching, you know, a different kind of teaching, and I enjoyed I enjoyed the teaching in public in the field in public health, and I enjoyed it in in the university too, and I li like the intellectual stimulation of the university as well. But uh, you're right about it being pretty physically tiring to be out in the field. Yeah. yeah. 
So I, I, the, the last question that I have here, and I think this is the one that everyone is going to want to know, do, if you were to go out to your car right now, is there a candle in, in the car <laughs> somewhere? I live in Gibson's BC. We have flowers in February. There is no candle. <laughs> so, so, of course, the book is Always Back a Candle, A Nurse in the Caribou, Chilcotin. Uh, Marion, where can people find the book or find more information about you and your other books? You mentioned you were a writer. I'm seeing here 15 or more than 15 books that you have. Uh, More than show. three. I, I don't even oh, know. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so, yeah, where can people go to find find this well, book and some of your other work? I always Pack a Candle is on Amazon, for sure. And um, in the local, your independent bookstore should have it. It's getting out pretty, it's it's not due to be released till the 25th, but it is getting out. Um, I know that I've got my own copies, and I think quite a few bookstores have copies as well. So that's where it is. My mystery novels are written under the name of Emma Dakin, E-M-M-A-D-A-K-I-N, and they're cozy mysteries set in England. And I desperately want to get back there for research. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the third book in that series is out this October. And I'm working on the fourth. I've got six book contract for this one. So um, uh, I'm busy lady. So. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot going on. And I'll say too, you can see in this book, or when you read this book, you'll see that you have that literature fiction experience. That this does read like a story. Uh, yeah, obviously, it is a story. It is your story, but it, yeah. it does read very much like a, a, a sort of a novel. That it has that sensibility to it. That really, the words just come off the page. Uh, it's really engaging. Do want to mention too that you note at the start of the book all the stories are real. You did take some liberties. You did change names for to protect identities for for various reasons. But it does read like a novel and and based in reality. I really enjoyed it, so I certainly encourage well, everybody to check it out. Thanks, Sean. It was a pleasure to write it. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, and and it's one of those things you know you know the material right. So yeah. I, you know when you really know something and you're really passionate about it, it comes, it really does come through in the page when you read it. And, and that's certainly the case in this book. Thanks a lot, Sean. So again, always pack a candle, a nurse in the caribou, Chilcotin, Marion McKinnon Crook. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. It was just fun. So there you have it. My discussion with Marion McKinnon Crook. And again, always pack a candle, a nurse in the caribou, Chilcotin, from our friends at Heritage House. My thanks to them for helping to set this up and encourage everybody to check it out. And, and my thanks to Marion for joining me all the way from Gibson, British Columbia. So that will do it for this week on the show. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. If you have not yet, please do subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast because they're going to be coming fast and furious over the summer. As I said, weekly schedule back in. We are coming at you. I'm very excited about the stuff that we have coming up. You're not going to want to miss it. So do subscribe and rate wherever you get your podcast. That really helps us out. Those five-star ratings, comments, all that good stuff helps other people find the show, keeps us chugging along here on the road to 200. We started this in 2012. We will get to 200 in the year 2021. And I'm very excited about what's coming between now and 200. And we have some plans for what this show will look like after 200 and really looking forward to, to what's coming up. So you're going to want to subscribe, follow along with everything going on. I'm on social media at the Sean Graham, and you can let me know what you want to hear on the show, either through that or at history slam at gmail.com. And as always head on over to activehistory.ca. Lots of great stuff over there. Last week, there was a post about the struggles of tenuously employed individuals within the discipline of history, mostly, I think, focusing on academics and academia, certainly tenuous faculty. It's a struggle for so many folks out there. So there is work being done by the CHA and Active History is very supportive of that. So you can check that out along with some of the other great articles that have been posted over the past month or so. Just uh, the site, I'm always amazed, just to keep chugging along with wonderful 
material. So head on over to activehistory.ca. You click on the podcast tab. You got all of our past episodes as well. So have a great week, everybody. I hope everyone is doing well, staying safe. We will be back with you again next week. But until then, if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.